Welcome, everybody, to the Rick Richards Show. I am, of course, your host, Rick Richards. It is November... Hold on a minute. Get this damn thing off. It is November 9th, 2020. And welcome to the show. This is just going to be a quick update, recapping some of the things we talked about last week. I am in my new location. A lot of people expressed some concern. Uh, I did a show on the first right after Halloween previewing the election and some other things that I, I thought were going to take place. And I had mentioned to people that I was uh, evacuating my old premises, uh, leaving, in a sense, downsizing, but not really, more like right-sizing. The COVID has, um, oh, the sickness. This can't say that other word or the channel gets smashed, shadow banned, suppressed, deleted, whatever. The sickness. The sickness has um, kind of shifted our focus more eastwards, and uh, so I'm kind of, um, you know, one guy on an island out here in the west, so it was uh, necessary to get a new set of digs, which I have done, and which is now set up nicely, and um, you guys are lucky, I will give you a tour very, very soon. But enough of that for now. Welcome to the show, as I said. Getting cold out here. Oh, that shit's tight. That shit's tight. It's no havoc neural, but it's refreshing in its way. So what has been happening? What's been happening over the last week? Well, a lot, a lot has been happening. But first, I'm going to, should we deal with the sickness or the election? Should we do the, the viral sickness or the mental sickness? <laughs> well, let's deal first with the viral sickness. So here in our neck of the woods, uh, BC, of course, we have been hearing daily now for the last uh, two months, maybe. Yeah, probably about two months that uh, transmissions are up, infections are up, cases are up, 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 up. Up, oh, we're watching it very closely. We're very concerned. And yet, here we are. When did all this start? The first time I heard about it was around the end of January, at the beginning of the year, and heard of these cases. And then, of course, I saw, and maybe you guys did as well, I saw all these wild videos coming out of China of people going, ah, you know, keeling over zombie type reactions, welding buildings shut. Yeah, it was really some over the top shit. And I think the purpose of that uh, in hindsight, I didn't know it at the time, but I do think the purpose of that in hindsight was to kind of stoke up that fear and get people conditioned to doing whatever's necessary. You get people scared enough, they'll make whatever deal you accept them just to keep them safe, right? People will do that on a micro level, as in one person. They'll do it on a macro level, as in group society, right? So, nevertheless, in that time, I mean, since we did our own um, isolation, I guess we can call it, uh, which started in mid-March, I still don't know a single person that has been hospitalized. I still don't know a single person that has died. And... The statistics bear that up. Uh, again, still in this province, I mean, I don't know how many people have gotten it now. The number is well into the thousands, I guess, what, what, 15,000 probably or so. I could be wrong, so fact check me on that maybe, but still zero people under the age of 40 have died. I know that much for sure. And that's not my opinion. That is the opinion of experts. That information was tabulated by the British Columbia Center for Disease Control. So I think the fear still is a little overblown, right? Um, and I'm, I'm basing that on what experts say. But nevertheless, we are going through this giant uh, pony show, dog and pony show, this song and dance, this circus, whatever you want to call it. We're starting this up again. And our, our beloved Bonnie Henry, who I, I really don't think is a bad person. I mean, people hate her. Um, a lot of people do, but, you know, and a lot of people love her, you know. See, I do have the gift with a lot of these public figures of being very, being able to stay very neutral in my um, observations and outlook on them. 
you know, there are some exceptions, but I don't know. I, I think basically she's, you know, she's, she, let's face it, she's been put in a very difficult position. And um, I would say for here, British Columbia, as far as restrictions and, you know, everybody's made mistakes everywhere. But I would say here we've had probably the fewest restrictions of just about anybody um, globally, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, I don't know what they're doing in Africa or South America. Those places never really seem to make the news much on this. But, um, you know, as, as far as the industrialized uh, world is concerned, I, I think here we have it fairly light, comparatively speaking. I mean, no one's getting wrestled to the ground for not wearing a mask. Although I guess there's still time, right? I don't know how much of that I put down to Bonnie Henry and how much I don't, but whatever. So um, in a nutshell, there's been new restrictions that have been placed. And what they are, if I can quickly encapsulate them, it is uh, no gatherings, uh, no, no gatherings outside your immediate family indoors, um, no uh, sports that involve physical contact indoors, uh, outdoor sports are okay, I think, as long as there's no uh, physical interaction. Masks now have become, and I, this isn't down to her, but masks have become pretty well mandatory everywhere. Everywhere that's indoors, I would say 90% of the places strongly suggest a mask. Which is interesting because Hardly anybody was wearing masks back in, you know, April or May when they did venture out. Uh, now masks have been everywhere and they've been increasing and increasing over the last month. But still, we really, the, the infection rate has only gone up. So how effective are masks? I don't know. I, I think you have a, a strong case to say, not that effective. Not that effective, right? Uh, so. Anyways, anyways, let's get on to, let's get on to some other stuff that's happening with the infection. So I'm going to take you for a brief trip around the world. Come fly with me. Okay. I won't sing. Sorry. Sorry. I know nobody likes it if I sing. All right. So Europe, Europe has really, really been smashed smashed by this, not just in terms of uh, infection rate, but in terms of reacting to the infection and the rules and the impositions. So as I mentioned, um, we've gone into a two week lockdown. And by the way, um, I shouldn't call it a lockdown because people are free to go pretty much where they want still, just activities have been sharply curtailed. But again, we're looking at two weeks and once again, there's been no specific criteria of what is expected to happen um, at the end of two weeks, which leads us to believe that the two weeks is going to be extended, right? That's pretty much what we're being set up for. The two weeks will become, see, two weeks from when it was done. So that would be 14, 20th. So they're going to, my guess is that they're going to extend it for a month so that we can save Christmas, right? Um, and then, you know, they're going to dangle this. Well, Christmas, spend it with the immediate family. Uh, New Year's celebrations are canceled this year. That's what's going to happen, right? And I mean, I don't need to be the great Kreskin to predict that. I'm sure most of you guys can see that coming as well. But anyways, um, so what's going on in Europe? Well, France is in a, a second national lockdown. People are allowed to leave their homes only to go to work. <laughs> Yeah, see, <laughs> once the money train runs out, don't worry. That You'll still be able to go leave and go to work. Uh, they can buy essential goods, seek medical help, or exercise for one hour a day. You hear that, Frenchies? You get one goddamn hour a day. If you think you're going to exercise for 90 minutes, smarten up. You're not doing 90 minutes. You're doing one hour a day for exercise. That's it. So, although... Here I can tell you, you can get really good exercise in one hour if you're doing high intensity stuff. Go on and do wind sprints for an hour. I guarantee you will, you will get a workout. Um, anyone going outside has to carry a written statement justifying their journey. Like, fuck, are you kidding me? 
All non-essential shops, restaurants, and bars are shut, but schools and creches, I don't know what a creche is, creche, uh, remain open. Social gatherings are banned. Uh, the rules will be in place until at least December 1st. In addition, Paris and surrounding areas, the curfew from 2100, that's nine o'clock, may be reintroduced and was initially brought in from October 17th, but dropped when the national lockdown was announced. Yikes. So, I mean, those guys, I mean, that's, you have to have written permission if you're going somewhere. Are you fucking serious? I can't believe they're not just, well, maybe they are rising up and I just haven't seen it yet, but that's, uh, man, if they try that stuff here, it, it won't go over well, I don't think. <clears throat> uh, Germany, partial lockdown. Uh, the closure of cinemas, theaters, gyms, pools, saunas, and bars, except for takeaway. Social contacts are limited to two households with a maximum of 10 people. Overnight stays in hotels for leisure purposes are banned. And for leisure purposes, hmm, okay, so I guess business travel is okay. So you got to justify what you're staying in a hotel for now. However, schools and creches, this creche again, man, I should have looked that up. Uh, shops and hairdressers are able to stay open. <laughs> hairdressers are able to stay open. Okay. <laughs> Gyms, no, but hairdressers, yes. Right. Uh, saunas. Yeah. Saunas, in all fairness, saunas, probably a pretty good idea to have that shut down. Uh, the measure will stay in place until November 30th. Italy. Now, any, if anybody recalls Italy back uh, when this, all this stuff started, Italy was the hotbed, the European hotbed um, during the early days, Italy and Spain. And um, it was hit quite drastically. So in Italy, uh, new nationwide restrictions are in place. Across the country, museums, which have been allowed to stay open, had to close. Museum, like, are, are museums really a high transmission location? I mean, okay. Um, there is a curfew from 10 o'clock to 5 a.m. Uh, during these hours, people can leave their homes only for work, medical reasons, or emergencies. Oh, God. Gathering for weddings, uh, sorry, gyms, swimming pools, theaters, and cinemas closed in late October, and restaurants and bars can only stay open until 6. Now, I'm not sure what the purpose of a curfew is. Is that just to decrease the traffic? Is the virus more potent, the sickness more potent after 6? I don't know. Maybe I'm ignorant, but that one seems a little strange to me. Gatherings for weddings, baptisms, and funerals were banned, and people were strongly advised not to leave their immediate areas of work except for study or health reasons. Somewhere out there, some lucky dude is saying, oh, sorry, <laughs> got to postpone the wedding again, sweetie. Who knows? Who knows when we'll ever be out of this? <laughs> Someone's, someone is enjoying this, and someone is being really frustrated by it. Uh, the country is now divided into red, orange, and green zones. Red zones, the areas with the highest level of infections, had to close all bars, restaurants, and most shops. Uh, factories and essential work services have remained open, including pharmacies and supermarkets. So it's basically back to what it was in March. In orange zones, restaurants and bars have closed, but hairdressers and beauty salons remain open. Got to look good. Uh, and green zones are no further measures beyond nationwide curbs. Hmm. What do you think? Um, what do you think the odds are people are going to start moving to these green zones? So in Spain, there's a new state of emergency. Spain began its on October 25th, so that's a couple of weeks ago now. Spain began its nationwide curfew after the government declared a new state of emergency. People in all regions, with the exception of the Canary Islands, will have to stay home between 11 o'clock at night and 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, Spaniards love their late night carousing, but I mean. The only permitted journeys are going to work, buying medicine or caring for elderly people or children. Uh, public and private gatherings are limited to six people. The state of emergency was initially put into force for 15 days, but was later extended until early May 2021. Are you fucking kidding me? So these guys are going to th these guys are going to have these limitations placed on them until May. That's more than six months. Oof, they're going to do that here too. Um, Spain's regional leaders can modify the start and end times of curfew. The nationwide measures follow a number of regional measures that were introduced earlier in October. 
God damn you guys. Face masks have to be worn by anyone over the age of six on all forms of public transport and in indoor public spaces across the country. Most regions in Spain have made masks obligatory outdoors as well. Belgium, curfews and closures. From November to mid-December, all non-essential shops and businesses, da, da, da. autumn school holidays have been extended. Working from home is mandatory for everyone who can do so. Uh, they have a curfew as well. I mean, I won't go through all the details on all these single things. Only if there's something that kind of stands out. Netherlands, a partial four week lockdown. Portugal, local lockdown and restrictions. Czech Republic, a national lockdown. Uh, Denmark, Denmark is just restricting social activity. Hmm. Lockdown from November 6th. Isn't it funny how all these places kind of kick all this stuff off at the same time, right? They just, they just all follow every other country. Nobody ever stops to think and try something different. Ireland, a new national lockdown. Greece, a new three week lockdown. Hey, what do, you, what do you bet that gets extended? Uh, November 7th, so November 21st, we'll have to check in with those guys. That's in two weeks and see if that keeps, that's continued. Sweden, now Sweden, lockdown measures not imposed. Hmm. Anybody that's been a faithful viewer of the show, and I know most of you are, um, remembers we were examining Sweden back in the early days and they had very little in the way of lockdown. Part of the reasoning was that they were wise and they were gonna just kind of let uh, herd immunity develop. Part of the reasoning was um, Sweden has become so lawless in so many areas that they really couldn't enforce a lockdown anyways. So I don't know. I don't know uh, if either of those or both of those are correct or, or neither of them. Um, there was no lockdown in Sweden, but in line with government advice, most people respected voluntary social distancing and started working from home where possible. The number of new infections is now rising again, but not as sharply as in other parts of Europe. Aha, so what does that tell us? That tells us that the lockdowns we did do made us more vulnerable to this second wave, right? Stricter local guidelines have been introduced in eight of the 21 Swedish regions. They include advice to avoid public transport, in-person contact. The measures are voluntary and they currently apply until November 17th or 19th, depending on the region, but could be extended. Masks are still not recommended. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, but there is a limit on the number of people sitting together in cafes and restaurants a maximum of eight per table. So the masks are fucking useless, man. They are fucking useless. Uh, on November 1st, a nationwide legal ban on public gatherings of more than 50 people was lifted. So they did have some restrictions. Uh, socially distanced events for up to 300 people are now allowed, but few are expected to go ahead in regions with guidelines. So there you go. And you know what? I know this is going on in Ukraine, Russia, I think is quite strict as well. But have some hope because it was just announced today. Let's scroll up here. Oh, get off Trudeau. I don't want to see you. Do not want to see you, man. Uh, why am I at the bottom of the page on this? Uh, Pfizer has, Pfizer, if you're not aware, is a pharmaceutical company. They've announced a coronavirus vaccine, maybe 90% effective. Now there is a lot of mixed reaction on vaccines in general. There is a lot of fear and a lot of suspicion. And then, you know, people will act like you're an idiot if you're suspicious about vaccines when all the government does is lie and manipulate you and, you know, essentially treat people like cattle. And then they're saying, oh, why don't you trust the vaccine? Well, shit, I wonder why. But nevertheless, uh, their vaccine may be 90% effective. Uh, and, you know, I mean, if, I've heard that people can get the sickness again, right? You can get it once and you can get it again. So if you can get it a second time, how could a vaccine be effective? It'd be like getting a vaccine for a cold, right? You just get a new cold. 
Uh, Pfizer said Monday that an early peak at the data on the coronavirus vaccine suggests the shots may be surprisingly robust. 90% effective at preventing COVID-19, putting the company back on track to apply later this month for emergency use approval from the Food and Drug Administration. Well, if that's all true, and if it is all on the up and up, um, the announcement less than a week after a presidential election that was seen as a referendum on President Donald Trump's handling of the crisis was a rare and major piece of encouraging news lately in the battle against the scourge that has killed more than 1.2 million people worldwide. Uh, uh, and also almost a quarter million people in the U.S. So nevertheless, um, this will be good for the stock market if you're someone that's interested in that. Uh, it'll be good for just encouraging public confidence and uh, getting things going back to normal. Who knows what the fuck they put along with um, other stuff in these vaccines. But whatever, you know, the overall, I guess that's a good development, right? But it did make me, it reminded me of something I saw earlier in the year. And I wasn't really doing any of the, um, uh, any of the casts back then in, in July. This, yeah, it was June, July around there. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't doing a whole lot at the time, but I did, I, I remember seeing this and thinking, hmm, that would be a good, a good subject to touch on in a show. And so this is back from July. Um, Eastman Kodak. Now, anybody that's as old as I am, I got a few years on me. I'll admit it. Hands up. I'm an old man. But the good thing about being an old man or an old woman, I guess, is that you've been around a long time and you've seen a lot of things and you can remember quite a few things. And one of those things I remember is taking pictures with, uh, and then getting the film developed. See, back in the old days, you didn't have you didn't have the picture on your phone where you can say, oh, that sucks. Get rid of that, man. You had to wait. You had to wait until you filled up the whole, damn, I got missed. the banks calling me again. You had to wait until you filled up the whole roll of film, and then you had to go in and take it get developed. And there was really only two major film developers. There was Kodak, and there was Fuji. Maybe Polaroid as well. But anyways, Kodak was a film company. So I was quite surprised when I saw this announcement uh, in the summer, Eastman Kodak to get 765 million US loan to make drug ingredients. I thought, that's awfully strange. Why, with all the pharmaceutical companies in the world, first of all, all these pharmaceutical companies don't need a loan to develop a virus, right? Or, or um, to develop a, a vaccine. They have plenty of incentive because, first of all, they're all pretty much, you know, wealthy, right? They have large pools of cash, access to credit, um, and lots of incentives. So I really don't see any reason that you would need to give $765 million to any company, I guess, just to look like you're doing something, let alone a film developing company, a company that was pretty much in the tank. And then I saw this interesting little thing. So uh, they'll get Kodak will get 765 million loan from the U S government to produce pharmaceutical ingredients in the country, helping reduce dependency on other countries by strengthening domestic supply chains. Yeah, that sounds good. The company's shares were trading at 880 after closing at 262 in the previous session. So this is when my suspicion kind of jumps up. They opened at 880 before the announcement was actually made. Hmm. So that's quite a jump, right? I mean, from $2.62 a share to $8.80, somebody's getting rich. And so I, sure enough, I looked at the, I looked at the stock picture for Kodak. And yes, here we go. See, we have a real dead, we have a dead company, right? tumbling along for months and months at a time between maybe and dropping actually it was dropping into the low twos then all of a sudden we get this announcement and it skyrockets it went right up to what it's just 33 dollars what was the what's the 52 week high for this uh 52 week range 60 dollars so this share went from $2, just over $2 to $60. That's incredible. 
Um, it doesn't even show that in the paper. That says that's the 52 week high. Um, and it opened. So, so government announcements, you can bet that there is people, the government announcement came July 28th. I would bet you every dollar I have that a lot of people in the government knew uh, that this announcement was coming and the, the scam was in, right? So, I mean, and, and now after that, after all that, a bunch of people got rich, the stocks dropped back down again, the $765 million has just poof, right? Um, and now Pfizer's come up with a vaccine. So that just illustrates these things, these viruses, sicknesses, whatever. Once you get them and the government working on something, you know that the fix is in. It, it's all a racket, people. It's all a racket. It's all designed to get somebody, not you, rich. Okay. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. That's almost always. Um, the underlying motivation for all of this stuff. So, all right, um, let's move on from that. Yeah, I have one other thing to show you guys. Oh, right, here we go. <clears throat> now you remember, you may remember. Uh, you may, may remember last week, I came out and I went against the popular opinion, right? Let's see exactly what I said. Uh, let's see what, what your, your faithful broadcaster, Rick Richards, had to say. Wow, I look better already, don't I? Um, so this was just from last week, November 1st, and I was making my predictions for the outcome of the upcoming US election. And you may recall at the time, most of the, almost all the polls and most of the news outlets, the experts were saying that it was going to be a landslide for Joe Biden. But what did Rick Richards say? Sorry, man, I keep getting diverted. I keep going off on tangents. Let's stick to the program. So here is my prediction for the election. I will not delay any longer. I will tell you exactly what I think is gonna happen. And what I think is gonna happen come November 3rd is, I don't think we're gonna to go to bed that night knowing who the president of the United States is. I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, I think we're gonna see a, a contested election in that the results will be contested. Right. So, so, who called it, right? I called it, and I did, said it, I did say I thought Trump would win the contested election, and my reason for saying that he would, I thought he would win the contested election is because he's one of the most litigious um, presidents in U.S. history, so he had to have been prepared. He, he, yeah, he, he had to have been prepared for all that stuff. Um, but it's been strange that the media has been so excited. And again, I always have to say this because people will assume that I'm a, a Trump shill or something like that. And I'm, I, I always seem to be in the position of defending Trump because like nobody else in history, Trump seems to, and I don't like him. I, I find the guy, he's a bullshitter. He's a con man. He's a blowhard. He shills for Israel nonstop. Hasn't lived up to any of his promises whatever, right? Nevertheless, the people that are against him are just constantly suffering from this Trump derangement syndrome so that, you know what, if somebody shits on your living room carpet, they give the dog a pass and blame Trump. You know what I mean? So anyways, that's, but that's what I thought would happen. Um, and now if you've been following the news, almost every media outlet has proclaimed Biden the winner. And <laughs> you're seeing all these articles Biden, how will he heal the nation? Yeah, after you calling people Nazis and all this shit, he, now he wants to heal the nation, right? But I mean, the media, it's just amazing. Once these guys get rolling, they're, they're in perfect lockstep with each other. They're all singing from the same sheet and it's all the same thing. They're just trying to constant, constantly roll forward the narrative that Biden has been elected and he is the president. 
And I will remind people that the media does not decide who wins the election. Uh, that is a process. And there are some glitches now we're seeing in the process that are, you know, frankly, a, a little bit disturbing. But uh, let me take you through a few real quickly, and then we will call it a day. All right. So Michigan County, Michigan County, the night of the election. And I remember the night of the election saying, wow, it looks like Trump is winning fairly handily. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the numbers start changing and swinging drastically the other way, right? So Michigan County flips back to Republican after 6,000 vote software glitches fixed. The software used to tabulate votes in one Michigan County sent at least 6,000 Republican votes to Democratic candidates. The state's GOP chairwoman, Laura Cox, revealed at a press conference Friday, the country has since swung back Republican. So a lot of this stuff is not so fast. Um, there's a whistleblower interview with a US Postal Service worker who alleged that mail fraud was committed in Traverse City, Michigan. And it seems like all of this fraud is coming to light in um, the states that would be considered swing states. Now, here is another article. Uh, this Sidney Powell claims there are 450,000 ballots that voted only Biden uh, and left the rest blank. And if, in case you're not aware of it, in case you live outside of the United States, in the US, um, during a presidential election, this is how it's different from Canada. Canada, you vote for your local candidate and that's it. Um, but in the US, you, you get a vote on the president and then you get well, what's called a down ballot vote. So you vote for other um, people like Senate, uh, House, and then other issues can be on there as well, like propositions usually, right? So people almost always vote for the full range of things. But Sidney Powell is claiming that there are 450,000 ballots that only voted for Biden and left the rest blank. So that in itself is very suspicious and very unusual. Uh, she claims her team has found 450,000 ballots with only votes for Biden and no down ballot selections made. Uh, Powell suggests that this number of single vote ballots is suspect and indicative of, in part of abject fraud and that she says flip the election to Biden. So, I mean, that may be the case. Uh, what else are we seeing here? And this is from Zero Hedge. It defies logic. Scientists find telltale signs of election fraud after analyzing mail-in ballot data. Most interesting thread popped up on Twitter Sunday from a data scientist who wished to remain anonymous regarding mail-in ballot data, which strongly suggests fraud occurred in the wee hours of the election night um, when several swing states inexplicably stopped reporting vote counts while President Trump maintained a healthy lead over Joe Biden. So, Anyways, long story short, God, every site is just so spammy now. Um, he's looking at statistic analysis. Uh, this is based on their proprietary Edison data source, which would ordinarily be impossible to access for people outside of the press. Uh, and the script to generate it is here, blah, blah, that's a link. I suggest that everyone back up both these files. It's extremely important. What we are looking at will be time series analysis, and you will see that it is extremely difficult to create convincing synthetic time series data by looking at the time series logs of the ballot counting process for the entire county. We can very easily spot fraud. One of, one of the first things noticed while exploring the data set is that there seems to be an obvious pattern in the ratio of new Biden ballots to new Trump ballots. As we can see on this, this log log plot, for many of the counting progress updates, we see an almost constant ratio of Biden to Trump. It's such a regular pattern that we can actually fit a linear regression model to it with near perfect accuracy, barring some outliers. How could this be possible? Is this a telltale sign of fraud? Surprisingly, as it will be shown, the answer is no. This is actually expected behavior. Also, we can use this weird pattern in the ballot counting to spot fraud. Here's the same pattern for Florida. Spot the linear pattern again. And again, Texas and again, South Dakota. So these are the patterns um, in places where uh, they don't believe any wide scale fraud occurred. California. Let's dig a little deeper into this. 
And I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this because I know people will zone out. Um, but basically, basically voting follows tends to follow a pattern when you look at it statistically. Um, and it's not doing that in this case, right? I'm going to see kind of these wild, uh, these wild patterns that stray. The linear line is typically is is the typical voting pattern, and when you see this wild outlying stuff, it means it, it's stuff that goes outside of the pattern. So the election, it seems to me, is not done yet. I mean, it is possible that there's just so many people um, against Trump and that just want him out that he may just concede if somebody sends him. A good deal. I did notice that his good friend uh, in Israel, <laughs> Benjamin Netanyahu, has kind of turned on him. We'll see. I, I'm not so confident that Trump will win now. I know I, I, I said that he would win the contested election. Yeah, that I'm not feeling so confident. Um, so there is one other big thing. Uh, a trucker strike in November could be another nail in the supply chain coffin. Uh, rumor has it that a large number of independent truckers are planning multiple strikes in November, during which they'll stop transporting everything. Considering that our supply chain is already precariously bad shape, imagine the impact if transport also came to a halt. There's a group called Stop the Tires Truckers that is organizing a strike, um, and it's got 15,000 people. And I will read their message. <clears throat> our message is simple and hopefully effective. We fully intend to exercise our rights and will not have politicians making crippling decisions that will negatively affect our future and the future of our children. President Trump has worked diligently for four long years to protect the rights and freedoms of all Americans and very importantly, the blue collar workers of this country. The blue collar workers are literally the ones that make the wheels turn. Without truck drivers, this country um, could not survive for long. Our intention is not to harm anyone. We would like to make a point that we do not wish for any companies or private truck drivers supplying any kind of medical supplies and or services to participate in our movement. We will not participate in the leftist Biden-Harris Green New Deal. We do not support the banning of fracking. The United States of America operates as a capitalist economy and oil is the fuel she survives on. So it seems that their issue is more about um, uh, the Green New Deal that uh, Biden is pushing. So this is somewhat election related, somewhat sickness related, but I just wanted to put this out there as a warning um, for all of you guys, because I think a combination of the sickness, the lockdowns, instability, you know, we could be looking at shortages. I'm, I've said before that I'm seeing shortages already. So if this is something that could be coming up, you may want to plan accordingly. So let's wrap it up there. As always, it's been, if not fun, then at least informative, enlightening, enrapturing, right? So I am your host, Rick Richards, and I will see you guys again real soon. Bye-bye.